I think it, I think it's something out for me. And I think it's something really important out for me pretty early because I was traumatized. I got to this realization quickly, which is the one kind of good bit. But if you're going to say, you know, there's, there's an upside to trauma, it's that which is I understood quickly that I inhabited the body, that um, I experienced things very intensely, um, maybe more intensely than other people, what looked to me like normal people, you know what I mean? And uh, I realized that art for me was a way of making sense of that experience, right? I never, I remember writing in London at art school and people being like, do you have crits? Does anyone go to art school? You'd have crits where you sit and talk about your work. And people would talk about their practice. It was amazing. It was the beginning of like 90 speak. Oh, my practice involves, you know, an interest in da da da, right? Which is great. I, mean, I, I, I get it. For me, the idea that you, you would choose a topic. Like, I think, I'll, I think I'll deal with this in my heart. Although that can produce amazing things. I was just trying to deal with this. What it meant to look. What it meant to to have sexual feelings, what fear, to be in my body or not be in my body, to make sense of the world around me. I used art to survive in many ways, to make sense of a world that didn't make sense to me and was very intense at the same time. So for me, um, I kind of blew past the intellectual kind of um, idea that you're meant to have a project in a way. I went straight to how does art relate to me and how do I make sense of my body and art was how I did it. Like instinctively from three, four years old I remember drawing with felt tips and finding this kind of almost meditative trance-like thing to be drawing. You know, where I, was, I felt safe, I felt peaceful, I could kind of make sense of the world around me. So, um, I felt and feel that the art that moves me most um, deals with these kind of unavoidable human situations, which is, if we're sitting here, we've been born, right? Which is a weird one. If you really sit and think about that you, I remember my, my daughter was born, my first child, the idea that we're in a room, there's me and my, you know, my ex-wife at that time, and it's only a third person arrives in the room from like nowhere. I mean, just like, as a sculptor, like, what, you built that mass and it came out and now there's this brand new person in the room and there was blood and screaming and like, 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 you know, no one knew what the fuck was going on and, and um, that astonishes me that we all had to go through that and just the thought, like, what was going on before that moment, do you know what I mean? And then the fact that, you know, inevitably you've got to die is to me already enough to make art about forever. Do you know what I mean? I mean, once I'd really clock that, like, what? Wow, this is over? It's, that's huge. And then that you, you have to navigate your relationship to other people, um, that you go through these archetypal things of feeling lust, feeling love, feeling anger, feeling loss, um, feeling lost. Um, and we redo it. We don't, we, we don't get better in it, really. It's not like, again, we don't evolve. It's not like we figured love out. Here's what you do. You know, so your dad's like, here's what you do with love, and this will work out. Or, you know, here's, here's how you handle your death. We, we, we tackle them brand new every generation, right? And we, we get some wisdom, and we get some knowledge, but we still grapple with those fundamentals. So for me, um, it felt, uh, urgent in an instant that I had to do that, right? That, that, and that I had to do that. And, and it related to my body and, and the bodies of people around me was essential. And that there is a tactile reality to life obsessed me, that I could touch things, that I could touch you, or that I could touch a material, I could change a material. Like, and I think partly because I grew up in Leeds and the social fabric was so fucked up, um, and the sort of reality that was presented to me was so ropey that I was able to imagine changing it. It didn't feel very strong. It didn't feel very grounded or authentic or real. 
So, um, and I was always really interested in, um, in painting. I, I, I... Let me ask you a question. Yeah. But then I thought, was that, is that radical? It's super radical. Why? Um, but it's, it's super radical um, in terms of like, uh, just the way you start to deal with the body, the kind of, the, the specifics of it, the realness of it, the, if you look at the ass of the guy, it's kind of saggy, kind of a saggy real ass. And, um, and he is, he's both realistic and a mutant. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's an alien. Look at that arm, look how long it is. I mean, Donatello did that all the time. He would, you know, we, at that time you're dealing with archetypes of the body kind of signifies the Madonna. Looks like this, the eyes are like this, ba 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 And he kind of came in and warped it out, right? Which I think artists, I, I'm, I'm doing massive platitudes, so if you guys are like, what are you talking about? Fuck you, say it. But there's a massive platitude I'm going to make. Art goes into the idea of perfection and actual real, like it looks like this. And then art sort of achieves that, quote unquote and then realizes it's kind of bankrupt. And so someone comes along and shows you that that slight warped, bizarre quality or wrong quality is important also to reality. And then they kind of come in and break, and break a kind of tight system. So Donatello kind of broke a tight system of, of presentation, of reality, of what art was meant to do. Kind of came in and gave it a kind of high pitched frequency. I mean, just look at that face. I mean, I wish you could walk around, but it almost looks like a Giacometti face. You know, it's got this kind of compressed, warped weirdness that I believe he knew he was doing. Mm. And maybe he couldn't help himself. That's also another artist thing the idea that you're in control of it. He kind of not. Obviously not. But I'm going to make my kind of smart point so then we can go back to. I was, I was, I have, I have a board, you've seen my magnet board, and I have this vast range of images on this magnet board at my studio because I'm traumatized by the late 20th century art system of teaching that everything was progress, and you know, this led to this, you know, the world famous Cezanne allowed cubism to happen, and then cubism happened, which allowed da 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 da, which in a way feels so great, in a way, do I? You know, like, oh, it's all logical and all this, like, it's reassuring, but it's of course not. Do you know what I mean? Like, really does, it, it, it makes sense and it absolutely is as ridiculous as can be. Because at the end of the day, again, cubism isn't any realer to me than that Donatello. They're just two ways of trying to explain reality, right? And how reality feels. But on this board, I'm trying to put together all these different things. So when I'm in Leeds, I, um, and I'm just gonna tell you, the guy is banging a, a rock against his chest. As I guess it's kind of yeah, flagellating, scraping, it's kind of, he's bleeding. And, and you, you wrap that up in, in a kind of religious iconography of, of like, oh yeah, that's what they have to do. But I think that's a human need, right? To feel pain sometimes, to, to manifest inner pain or inner anxiety without a right? I mean, in, in the therapy language, but also in an artistic language, to, to kind of, I'm alive. You know, I feel this. And when I was a young guy in Leeds, and I, and I didn't know I was a sculptor, I didn't think I'd be a sculptor, I was kind of doing these weird performances that I thought were to do with music. Because I'd, I'd grown up on the north of England music scene, which was Happy Mondays, The Fall, Gang of Four, where the concerts were kind of punk inspired, they'd just kind of be chaos and people would yell. And, so it was, Great, because it was, I was, it was fabulous. And so I was doing this kind of performance art, and I, which I didn't really know what, what it was. And so I went to a designated, in order to go to art school and even apply for a grant, you had to go to a crappy local school that was meant to be for applied art, where you would learn to like make wallpaper and be useful. It was like, certainly if you were from provincial shitty towns, it was like, do something useful, and, and, and if you don't want to do something useful and you really want to be one of those arty people, this will break you down. <laughs> and you will, Mar Margaret Thatcher actually talked openly about this will get rid of eyes, because she was horrified by like art departments with angry leftist students, like man, you know, that whole thing. So you had to go to this, this it was called Jacob Kramer Foundation School of Art and Design. I had to go to it to even qualify for a grant. 
And by some phenomenal fate, all these crazy art people uh, who were from the north, the only job they could get was at this school. And some of them had been Joseph Boyce's students or had accompanied Joseph Boyce around England and stuff like this. So I like, walked into this uber radical, crazy school where they saw my weird performances. I was cutting myself and I was sort of doing this self-hurt stuff. And they were like, here's Chris Burton. And this piece is called, I think, Doorway to, to Heaven, where he put two electrodes on his chest and he had to do exactly the same moment to not blow himself up. And so that I guess the electrical current would go through his body and, you know, I don't know the science of that, but it's, I was shown that image of this guy um, doing that in this oddly, almost religious look, right? This is a glow. It was like a religious. And as I walked around the show and I saw all these images of suffering and pain, I mean, the, you know, <coughs> the early Renaissance, I'm really Renaissance. Big on yeah. Catholicism seems to be good. Yeah, yes, you know. And the eroticism of it and, and, the, and the complexity of pain. And I was really, I sort of really sat there and thought, these are all the issues that I feel like at the beginning of the 21st century we sort of have to uh, to walk in and go, hey, I'm a modern artist, I'm not interested. It's so clearly ridiculous with the world that's going on. And if I look at your films. Um, where you really tell stories. I mean, you know. Well, I believe in that. Right. I think it's very important. Right. But I think that sto story narrative in cinema is the equivalent of figurative art. I mean, I, I, which doesn't mean that I, you know, we've discussed this. Jackson Pollock, for example, is an incredible artist for me because he still believes in the fantasy of structure and emotion in the work. And I think you need that. And so narrative is the equivalent of, of that for movies, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that the, that the experiments and the, and the movements in the 20th century where they pulled things apart and took it Which was necessary. Makes sense, and it's fabulous, and I, I love that work. It's a dead end, though. Uh, well, again... What happened to Pollock? What did he do, right? He returned to representation. Well, he returned, he returned to, to, the, to representation. It was fantastic. He did a series of, of these where he makes face, and Clement Greenberg is yep. him, um, where, where you really see the tyranny of, of the yep. intellect, right? And yep. of, of our history, which is, does any art historians here spend, I mean, you need to spend time with artists and makers of art and filmmakers and make sure you go and have your ideas like fucked around with, for, for want of a better word. Even by artists you hate. I don't know if there are any art, any art historians, but, but I agree with you, and I think we share that. Um, that the idea, this this image, is just absolutely. So why, 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 why is what you're saying not conservative? I don't think it is, by the way. So I'm just curious. Well, yeah, I mean, I, what you're saying is the 20th 20th century pulled it all apart, right? Right. Especially I, after 1968, the whole thing gets pulled apart. Yeah. Again, I I believe I, I'm happy that everything's possible, right? So I know, I know artists whose work is extremely esoteric, let's say, is, is almost not leading to any kind of object. I was taught by a guy called Stanley Brown, one of the great Fluxercise, who was uh, Surin Surinese, but, but grew up in Holland. And his art was about one of his pieces that, that struck me as like, magical and cosmic, was called This Way Brown. And he would walk around Amsterdam and say to people, oh, hey, uh, um, can you, can you uh, tell me how to get to Dam Square? I mean, he knew where Dam, Dam Square was, and they would draw, he would say, can you draw me? They'd say, oh, it's over there. He'd say, can you draw me a, a map? And they would draw, you know, Dutch people are really nice, they'd draw, and, and then he would blow up that drawing, and that would be his work. And he'd have a stamp on it, this way, Brown. And it was about the idea of navigating and, and chance, and, you know, the, this sort of mapping, and he had, he had a huge influence on me, but he was also unbelievably conservative. I remember I was at art school in, in London, and I got into Amsterdam, and by some miracle, I don't know quite what, and a lot of the teachers there were like these radicals from the 60s, and I remember some guy who really hated me, thought I was like an asshole from the North of England, you know, like a real peasant, 
and, uh, and was 